cool. I think now there's a thing. The thing that does the thing. Um. Now I went into. I think I got files. That's stupid. Um. Did y'all? I saw. I added a file. Oh, here we go. Files. I thought I shared a file. Did anybody see me share a file in the freaking chat thing or in like the file sharing thing? Uh, yeah, I can, I'll just upload it again. I thought I like used the right file. It's fine. Here, here. This is this is just um for anybody who doesn't have access. It's the um as soon as it does its thing. It's the uh it's not the whiteboard. I don't think. I think it's just the. Is there a whiteboard that's now created? I don't think so. I mean, I'll just show the file. It's just the um, I just scanned the pages of Caruth we're going to be talking about. Um, oh, it says the file already exists. Replace it, whatever. And go. All right, there you go. Um, in case somebody has lost their copy of the book or whatever. It's, so it's in the whiteboard? Damn. I had no idea. Okay. So the question now, Maddie, is how the F do I get to the whiteboard? Oh, screen sharing whiteboard. Let's see what happens. I don't even know. It looks like a blackboard. Okay, 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 cool. That's probably better. I'll stop trying to share the freaking whiteboard then. Um, and just be unshared. Stop presenting. Oh, that's lovely. okay. I don't care what was for that. Yeah, yeah. If you just if you just click on the freaking thing or whatever, it'll it'll pop up. Um, the little file there that says scan the symbol first. I'll just click that. Come up. It's just it's just. I mean, if you have the copy of Caruth with you, um, that's really all that it uh it requires. All right. Um. Yes. So, say what? What? Oh, nothing. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Um, let's see here. Oh, yeah. So let's go. Oh, actually, well, wait a second. Sorry. I I was looking at the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, the Teams link thing. And I thought that it said like all 13 people were in here. I was like, holy crap, the whole class is here. Let me start. But like, I guess that was just all the people I invited and not all the people who actually <laughs> are here. Um, so I'll, so we'll just, we'll just wait a second or two. Maybe they'll, um, 420, no pothead joke intended. Um, just to see if everybody can, um, there more people happen to trickle in before we start talking about stuff. Um, so that said, I think um, Maddie's question in the chat was is a good question in general. Um, how's the papers coming? Um, so yeah, if you're just about eight pages, as you you didn't submit it yet, did you, Maddie? I mean, you did. That's cool. Good on you. All right, cool, cool. I mean, you're not you're not required to yet by any means. I was just curious if, yeah. I mean, if you, yeah, if it's about eight pages, that's okay. I mean, eight. That's that's that should be fine. Like I said before, like my fallacy is don't believe the argument and fluff me up a paper that's not, you know, that just says the same crap over and over. Hey, hey, just, hey John. Yeah, I figured if we waited a second or two more, more folks would trickle in. So that's good. Whoa, there. Is there a dragon in their backyard or dorm room? Is that you, Sixto? You got a dragon up in there? What's up? I don't know. I just heard some background noise that sounded kind of like I was saying dragging open a manhole cover or a, a dragon roaring. Uh, that's yeah. I was right. just drawing up there. Oh, fair enough. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> You're fine, man. I was just joking around. Hey, Jesus. I think how it is. It ain't easy being breezy, as they say, probably in the 90s. <laughs> probably before y'all was alive. Um, do, do, do. So we'll, we'll wait. Just a, We're just gonna in a holding pattern real quick to see if some more people click, on, click into the class. So I don't end up doing stuff repetitively more than I already do. 
Um, thank you all who fill out the the course evaluations. Um, so that's a good question. All right, um, Matt, that's a good question. Um, you know, what what does it say? What does it say in the assignment? I mean, it'd be it would be good to have it in by like the seventh, right? But like, I think what I said in class was like. The seventh is like the the gold, like you get a gold. You don't get an increasing grade or anything. I'm not like that, but you get like a gold star for turning by the seventh. But like, um, if it's not in by the like, I think my final grades would be the eleventh. Like I have to have the, everything graded and entered into the um, whatever it's called, the PeopleSoft system, right? Um, by the eleventh. So like by the midnight on the eleventh, and so like, it's do the seventh. But like, if you don't get it to me by the tenth, like there's a very good chance that it will not be calculated in your grade just because of the laws of space and time. Does that make sense? Like, I mean, I'll, I will make every effort to grade everything that's turning me by the 10th. Um, so that's like the date that like, if you don't have it done, like stop walking your dog, stop, stop eating and start riding until it's done. And afterwards you can walk your dog and you can have a meal, but like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So if, the, if, if it's in on the seventh, there's a question room where I can give also like this. And this is, I mean, I don't want to be, uh, what do you say, give too much inside baseball, but I think you will notice this in any of your classes you always take. There's a um, law of diminishing marginal return regarding how close you get final papers into professors and the amount of critical feedback they're able to give you on those papers before entering a final grade. So for example, if, if Matt, if I'm just going to use you as an example, Maddie, um, if you turn your paper on the, the seventh, right. Um, there's a good chance that I will get the paper graded by the eighth or the ninth. Um, and you'd be giving you nice marginal comments. Like this is a very good point. This is a very good point. I'm not for the purpose of revision, but for the purpose of edification that you can, go, okay. Like going, I mean, I mean, our professors always hope that our students read the comments at the end of the semester, right? Like, oh, okay, like this is this is like this is a great sentence here. Okay, I see where you're going here, but like maybe a little bit of wording to be helped, right? And then and then a nice in comments, you know, paragraph length in this paper, you'd really give it this, this, and this, right? Um, and and like could improve this or whatever, and then your grade, right? Um, I think you'll notice if you turn the paper in on say like the evening of the eighth or the ninth or into the morning the tenth, right? you're much more likely to get um, a, a comment like, good job, um, which doesn't mean your professor didn't read. Like, I'll obviously read all the paper, right? But to take the time to give the thoughtful marginal criticism, all of a sudden I have um, seven papers that are in, and, like, my biggest um, duty as a professor, right, is to give you – to read your work in full and give you the the, the objective letter grade that you deserve um, for um, the paper, right? And not so much at that point to give you flowery and helpful comments because, like, if I don't get so seven papers graded, then I have seven students who don't have that in their calculated final grade, and that's more of a problem, right? Um, so just again just trying to get i mean i have tried to be and will continue to be in my professional career like as open as i can with you all about like not only like how things work um in my own head as a professor cuz i mean I, as as a junior senior level class and a lot of your interest in education it's it's i mean hopefully somewhat insightful to know like what your instructors are thinking as instructors um in, in the course of teaching the class and so just to and just to let you know like I mean, what are expectations that are probably realistic as far as like, okay, I got the, I just got the paper in like, you know, at 11.59 on the 10th, like, <laughs> you'd be damn lucky to see a letter, like, just like, I just like a hastily scrawled letter grade and turn it in, right, just to beat the clock, right? And so I would not expect um, full narrative comments and suggestions for further improvement in that circumstance, if that makes sense. Um, that said, I'm not, I mean, if people have um, more open Christmas breaks and don't ha and are very interested in discussing their um, final papers into the winter break, um, regardless of when they're in the comments, giving back, I'm always like, shoot me an email, like, hey, Professor Graham, you want to do a team's meeting if we can talk about um, 
my theory paper, even though I got it in at, you know, at 11 o'clock on the 10th or whatever, and you just give me a letter grade. Like I, I'm always happy to do that too. Um, if that makes sense. Um, so any, I guess any questions on that or the policy? So like, yeah, I mean, people will be emailing me and be dinging my computer. And I don't even know. Maybe it was me. Hold up. No, I don't think it was you. It was, it wasn't you. It was my, it was some freshman comp students because I'm using my same computer to like teams. As I am, I have to have my volume up. And I guess I don't know how to silence my notifications for my email. So forgive mm -hmm. the little Pavlovian bells dinging off in the back of the background. Um, <laughs> should be okay. Um, all right. So I guess, um, that said, are there, are there any questions about the final essay? Um, other than okay well that's okay are there any questions about the final essay other than like when it's due and those are the, the the due dates which are you know like please have it in by the seventh you better damn well have it in by the tenth <laughs> all right um and then i guess the, um so there are so i know that there are a couple people i mean well let's me i don't think it's a ferpa thing let me just like be frank right we have a couple students who are here who I think we can just process of elimination have not yet presented um, for the class, right? Um, and not to call, I'm not calling anybody out. I'm just saying like, I've been thinking and praying about how to resolve that situation. Um, and I think the best thing to do at this point is because it's it's difficult to present on teams in the same way it was in the classroom. And like, also just to be frank, like the rest of your classmates got up and braved the, the, the tornado of doing the presentation in class, right? So I think I think a suitable alternative may be if you want to create a PowerPoint on or a presentation of some whatever format you want to use or, or even just an outline, right? Um, and, and and send that to me, um, and then do a. I mean, I know people are really shy, like video being preserved forever in cyberspace is, is ter terrifying to some people. I get that. Um, so like I'm not gonna require y'all do a video presentation, right? But if you can get me an outline or as PowerPoint that had, and then do like a audio recording. I know y'all got cell phones and computer. Obviously, if you get here, you got a computer, right? You can do a little like not so that podcast format, but like go to QuickTime Video, freaking hit record, whatever your software is, right? And do a you know seven to ten minute presentation on the on what would be right the um the 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 powerpoint or the outline you provide me right um i will review those and consider those as fulfilling the requirement for the presentation of the class um that said i think i'm not, okay that was a full stop on that um i think there might be there may be a bit of a um or a, a curve or a, a cap on the, the 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 so okay there will be there will be no no one and no this is just a matter of just i'm not i i'm i don't think it's fair to have folks who who present digitally for whatever reason right have the same potential for a high a as for students who did it in class just because it's very uncomfortable to present in class and so um, I don't want to delimit the work that they've done and the, the, the courage that they've had. Not that you don't have courage, y'all, just that, like, it's a different kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm about to say that um, the digital presentations, I'll, instead of getting the possibility of having, like, a 90, 99.5 being the top, top grade, I'm going to cap the top the online presentations at 94. That said, if you do it, you may still earn up to a 94. Um, which is still a mid-range A, and I don't do minuses in the class, so it's still potential for success. I just want to put that out there as letting you know. I don't think that um, I think it's a different thing, and I think I I I feel like I'm being very accommodating to allow that to be a format that can work. Um, and so you'll have to give me some latitude in, in um, scaling the grade to some extent, but I'm not giving you C's or anything right off the bat. So if that's not a tenable um, solution, if people are irked by that, um, feel free to email me. We don't have to have knock on drag out in front of the class, but feel free to, to shoot me an email or a message um, and we can discuss a, a more palatable solution if that is not one. Um, I hope, however, that that will be one for all either presenters who've already presented or those who have yet to go.
Um, and like I said, we can we can hash that. I just wanted to put that out there too, since I have four of y'all's attention at the moment who showed up to class. Um, all right, so okay, so that was that was the one other housekeeping thing I wanted to do. Other than um, I I have had some students from class um, send me draft of their final paper and want to set up times to converse about them um, and me to give comments back and feedback back um, before the paper is due. Um, I am in the process of reading and commenting on those papers who didn't have, who have had drafts sent to me already um, and am setting up meetings too. So I just wanted to make sure that um, you all were aware of that opportunity um, and got in and we can take advantage of it if you want to. Um, no one is required. I mean, it's not a requirement that you send me a draft that I get a comment on before you can submit. If you got the chops and like, hey, I'm going to send this thing in, man, then that's cool. And there's no penalty or anything for that. Good on you. Um, and there's no, I mean, it's often like, oh, if you met with Professor Graham and like talk with him about the paper, he'll like give you an A for sure. Like, no, I mean, maybe, but like not because you meet with me, just because like, like if you do good work, right? And I just find it, I think it's a fact of life that this is not universal, but students who write papers in advance and take them through multiple drafts and iterations as opposed to like, shit, it's 10 o'clock, 59, it's on the 10th, I got to and then like send it, oh, thank God, oh, shit, I forgot my bibliography, right? Um, those students tend to perform somewhat slightly less tremendously than students who have taken it through multiple drafts. Um, I'm sure you are all students of the first variety, uh, but I just want to, it's not a personal prejudice I have against procrastinators. I'm a procrastinator myself. I just wanted to say, methodologically speaking, why it usually falls out um, into those two camps. Um, so any questions on, I guess, the drafting process. Krista! Sorry, everybody. If I broke eardrums or anything. Hi, Krista. Hey, there, hey. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Well, I see a little, I see a picture. That's, that's, yeah. Um, so we're just talking about um, final, final paper stuff. Um, we've just been kind of doing um, housekeeping up to this point, sort of about presentations and, uh, Found papers. If you haven't missed anything, um, necessarily, maybe some some of my general f philosophies of life side comments, which I tend to give out on on uh, solicited, but that's really nothing to miss. Um, so, I guess we just, so. I guess the question I just have for everybody is: so does everybody understand the process of the final the final paper? Um, you can reach out and give, give me drafts if you want to. I'll give you comments on them if you want. Um, not required to. Everybody's. Nobody's like, hmm, we have a final paper? Hmm. Like, when do we turn or how do we turn? Everybody's, we're all copacetic on that, yeah? And if somebody's not, like, put your little digital hand in the air like this or whatever. All right, everybody's good? Cool, cool. All right. So, um... That said, I guess we can go, Krista, there's um in the meeting chat, there's a, a scan, um, says scan December 1, 2020, I think. Um, if you if that, that's if you don't have the copy of the Caruth book um, in front of you, I scanned, a, I'm, what is, I'm, I'm sure, a non-illegal via copyright law amount of it, wink, wink, um, into the sidebar. Um, just for us to, to have reference to in case somebody didn't have their book or like their dog ate it during Thanksgiving or something. Um, or they left it at their grandma's house. All right. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about... So let me open up the document actually so I can reference what y'all looking at instead of what I'm looking at. Oh, it does kind of look like a whiteboard when you like click on the thing. That's cool. All right. Um, so everybody can... See the so everybody click on that or or go to your book. So if you're following, sorry, if you're playing along at home and following your book, we'll be on what is page ten. Um, actually, sorry, let's not. So if you, I so okay. So, da, 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 da. Dr. Graham is very bad at making 
documents in order. So there is, it is all in order, right? But then I was like, oh, yeah, I want to also include the last two pages of the introduction, um, or I guess the last three pages of the introduction. So instead of starting on page one of this document, right, let's start on page freaking um, five of the doc, yeah, page five of the document, which is page seven in your book. Um, we're talking about trauma, about trauma and history is the, the subheading, right? Um, it's on the bottom half of seven on the book, right? Um, and we'll read from it, discuss it. I think it's just important because, um, it, it's talking like it, as far as a summation or a summary of what, um, what is that a, is that a chat thing? Does somebody chat me? Hang on. I hate, I hate this teams. Um, I'm going to chat. No. Wait, why is my little thing go off like I got a message in chat and I didn't get a message in chat and I X'd out of the whiteboard because I thought I got a message in chat and I didn't get a message in chat. So I'm going to go back on the whiteboard. Oh, well. All right. So as I was saying, um, I think that the the, por the portion here is helpful and relevant um, to, to a great degree just because it does a... a decent job of um talking about kind of what we were talking about 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 how she's incorporating and using this idea of trauma um the narrative ablative experience right as, as a, a as a lens to view these other psychoanalytic um principles and these other um i guess you would say like sister discourses in the field of, of trauma and trauma studies right so um so, right, so that's, um, I'll, I'll read from the bottom of seven here and we'll talk about it for a second, right? So, the story of trauma is then as a narrative of a belated experience, far from telling of an escape from reality, the escape from a death or its referential force, rather attests to its endless impact on a life. In Tassel's story, indeed, as we read it in Freud, Tengri does not escape the reality of death's impact, of the wounding accident and of Clorinda's death, but rather he has to live it twice. The crisis at the core of many traumatic narratives, as I show concretely in my readings of Floyd, de Ross, and Lacan, often emerges indeed as an urgent question. Is the trauma the encounter with death or with the ongoing experience of having survived it? Right. At the core of these stories, I would like to suggest is thus a kind of double telling, an oscillation between the crisis of life, of crisis of death, sorry, and the correlative, 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 correlative crisis of life. Right, between the story of an unbearable nature of an event and the story of the unbearable nature of its survival. So this is kind of, again, we're kind of in the abstract a little bit, right? Talking about these really like odd principles in this kind of literary um, framework, right? But like this, to me, this seems to make some more sense concretely, right? Like what we're looking at. So I guess what, what if, we're just, if we're to ask a question like on like a, a short answer final, which we're not going to have, Right, like, what does Caruth configure? Like, what's what's the interesting points of intersection that Caruth is looking at trauma as? Right, like, why? Or, or maybe a better question, or maybe a better way to word it, some kind of just the top of my head is, um, like this urgent question that trauma is an encounter with both death and the experience oh. provided. Like, what do you mean by that? What what do you think she's trying to get at? Um, in this weird paradoxical questioning. I don't think there's like a wrong answer. Just like, what, 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 what she, what she, the hell is she talking about? Oh, sorry, there's a chat message. There's a chat message. Oh, cool. You're a fast typer, Maddie. That's really cool. I am a slow typer. Okay, definitely. So, and so, yeah, so let, me, let, me, let me complicate that a little bit, Maddie. I think you're right. Um, this So, as much as it is an appreciation of life, which I think it is, how does it trouble or complicate that appreciation? Um, in some way. Like, I don't think it's, I mean, it is definitely an appreciation for life, right? But there's also like a, 
like a problematizing of that appreciation to some degree, right? That's going on because it's in, I mean, because I mean, I think the terms she uses are telling, right? The crisis of death and the crisis of life. So how has, maybe the question is, how has the survival of the crisis of death in some way made life itself a crisis? I mean, yeah, that's probably good wording. And anyone can jump in. This isn't, this isn't like, I forget the game show, what it was like. It was like, wait, this team, this question's only for the blue team. This question's only for the red team. All right. Yeah, Mariana, that's good. Like, yeah, I think definitely. So there's, there is, and there's going to be, so again, this is like both literature and theory, right? There's not going to be a single right answer. I, I think a prong of the way that it does make, um, uh, I'm just giving thumbs up to people who answered. Okay. That, that make, um, it does make life a crisis, right? Is a notion I think you're going to get Mariana of like survivor guilt, right? Um, of to have an experience close to death affects one's appreciation of life, but also there's the, um, oh, what is it? Um, in, in, in the wasteland, right? At, at time, um, at my back from time and time and time to time I hear um, like, like, well, in, in sorry, in Marvel, it's time's hurried chariot wing or time's winged chariot hurrying near. It's the, the chuckle and a grin from ear to ear in Elliot, right? The skull of death approach, right? But the, the idea that there is um, that none of us are get out of this alive, right? And, and the, the closer encounter with that, there is to some degree a, um, like an appreciation, but also a, a growing awareness of that that end point being out there, maybe. Um, and, and I think what you get with survivor's guilt too, right? The idea that um, surviving something that's very difficult has psychological implications um, for how you view the world after that. It, it changes, I guess, like maybe not an innocence necessarily, but a way you view the world in which um, that is sunnier before you encounter that, right? And so like the, the pain of reliving the trauma or of dealing with the trauma, right? can some i mean obviously with the dsm right um which we're not getting into really but like leads to suicidal ideation or other negative implications of thoughts right because of the experience and the gravity of it that make it difficult to escape from its overwhelming past even brought and it drags forward into the present too right um i think that that's that's partly what she's talking about too um to get to maddie's point which i think yes yeah, the survivor's guilt too yeah yeah yeah, so I think you both key on the survivor's guilt um, aspect of it, right? Um, and I think that there, um, so let me, the next sentence I think adds maybe the, and maybe it's not a bifurcation, like a complete fork in the road here, right, that we're talking about. Maybe it's uh, like a fork and then a, su or a turn and then a sub point on that turn. If you're all, if anyone's a visual learner out there and can understand what I'm doing by going like this. Um, so the, 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 between the story of the unbearable nature of an event and the story of the unbearable nature of its survival, right? These two stories, both incompatible and absolutely inextricable, ultimately define the complexity of, I refer to as the history in the text I read. And Moses, okay. So the idea that there is, um, and this goes back to her opening thesis, right? This paradox of knowing and unknowing, right? Um, so not only knowing, are feeling guilty like why did i survive right but i think there's a, a question in the traumatic narrative that's like why the f did this happen right um i was gonna only like why did i survive and somebody else not survive or why did this happen why did this happen to me why did um why did it, there's a line from the um, i don't know if y'all have seen the book of mormon musical but the book of mormon musical there's there's one like um a, a solo where the guy's like um Dear God, why do they? I'm not gonna sing it. Um, I'm just gonna just write it like poetry. Um, but dear God, why do you let bad things happen? More to the point, why do you let bad things happen to me? Right? Which, which is partly the question. It's well, it's a question in uh, in, in philosophy and theology called theodicy, right? Um, which is why does a God who's supposedly good let bad shit happen at all? Right? How is there evil in the world? From a philosophical question, if people are good. Right, and not all shitbags. Like, how come 
if people are not that way and are actually good, how do cause how come people do evil stuff? Why, how does evil get in the world if we're not evil, right? Um, and so the, there is a paradox that this this raises too, right? It, it is is the similar is like the part between knowing and uh, not knowing, right? There's an inextricable but paradoxical nature of, I think, um, of knowledge of experience, right? Is that it's at the same time impossible. In, in my conception as a subject, as an I, as a person, it's impossible in my conception of the world that this thing could have happened at all. It's further impossible that it could have happened to me. And it's further, further impossible that this impossible thing could have happened to me and I survived it and I'm still alive. So my life, in that sense, right, or, or life itself as a concept has become to some extent impossible to conceive of not in a survival guilt kind of way right but just like you know like as as a thing and, and, and like how it becomes like incomprehensibly complex to see the history of myself and what got me here and how i made it through like does that make sense at all i'm saying i'm sure it's not it's just not crystal clear, i'm sure but it's like am i am i moon speaking entirely kind of okay that's 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 as good as I can hope for me. Um, yeah. So I think to clarify, like, okay, let's think of it this way. Um, so how do we how do we think of okay? What makes ourselves a self? Like, what? How do we think of? Uh, and don't do the whole phenomenology. We're not really selves. We're not like no. Like, if we think of, I'm sure, I'm sure, Maddie, Jesus, if you, you know. You have, I'm sure you have a debit card. I'm sure you have a pin number. I'm sure that when you go to Walmart or wherever you go and buy something with your pin number, right? That like the crop, the thought of, hmm, I'm not a self. This might not be my pin number. This might not be my debit card. My checking balance might not be what it is, right? Doesn't, I'm sure that doesn't complicate the, the process of going to buy a pillow or potato chips or whatever, or kombucha or whatever it is, right? Um, it doesn't it doesn't complicate me running up my bar tab, that's for sure, right? Um, and so I'm just saying, so for the sake of argument, um, let's just say that we all have some conception of self, right? Like what defines who you are as a self? Like how do you come to, okay, I am, we have, we have like self-image, we have self-esteem, we have, you know, relationships with people who hopefully in their relationships to us, like, consider us as people right like how do we arrive at these things like what what attributes or elements go into what makes you a self yeah that's true man you can't have that out of our experience yep yeah isn't this epistemology say what isn't this epistemology I mean, to some extent, I'm not trying to get to the epistemic, uh, the ep epistemic argument, right? Like mm -hmm. how, yeah. So I, I think I'm just trying to get more like, to like take it down a level from the philosophical and just be like, yeah, your personality, right? Are you an introvert? You're an extrovert, right? Um, <clears throat> are, are you, um, I guess, I mean, I mean, sexuality, identity, racial identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, gender identity, um, are you a punk or a cowboy or a click at high school, right? Are you a prep or a goth? Are you a nerd? Are you a drama nerd? Are you a band nerd? Like what, what subset of nerd are you, right? I was, I'm a debate nerd and I'm like a, yeah, right? I'm a drama nerd, but I was not a band nerd. I have no physical ability whatsoever, so I'm not a band nerd, right? Yeah, there you go. That's great, Maddie. Yeah, um, exactly. Like those are those things, right? And so then you ask the question, okay, so how did I arrive at this conception of self right and you would have what i would call i think what she's trying to talk about here is a history of the self right like and it just answers basic questions like like why do you consider yourself a southern american imagine well because you're born in the south right there's elements of southern culture that you in your history right have being a culture to identify with value, etc. Right? The same with Christianity, probably, right? And American is like you're well, I mean, there's different things that means to be American than just be a citizen, right? But I'm, I'm gathering um
Yeah, yeah. Right. No, you're right. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, the things are linked together, right? And so what? Yeah. So that's a good, that's a good metaphor. Um, so people can think of like, at least for for these intents and purposes of our, and we talked before about not to not to give, because we kind of came down to like the not too philosophic terminological level, but um, so diachronic identity, right? Diachrony is what, um, yeah, and then yeah, is being able to like have reflection too, right, Maddie? And like, see, or what's that? It's um, theory of mind, it's called, right? Theory, as opposed to theory, theory of mind, right, is being able to relate to how people perceive you, right? Um, which is a really key developmental stage in children, right? Is if they develop a theory of mind, right, which is like, hey, like <laughs> little Susie's real pissed at me when I grab her hair and kick her kitty, right. Maybe I don't want little Susie really hate me because like it's good to be perceived as good with others. So I should treat little Susie and her kitty and her hair in a way that is not like fucking mean, right? Like if you just have a mirror to yourself and there's no seeing how other perceive there's no so theory of mind, right? Is a theory of mind because you have a theory in your head about how other people's minds are working and perceive you. And your ability to be socially adaptable and compatible to some extent is a function of how well you see what other people are seeing and, and can sing, can play, you know, can play the game by the rules that are established, right? If you're playing four square, right, and you just run in and just tack somebody, blindside them, right, you're probably, well, first of all, you're not fucking playing four square. Second of all, you're probably not going to be invited back to play four square ever again with a group of children you just tackled, right? So, and that's a theory of mind issue too, how well you can perceive the expected schemas and then address or adjust your behavioral patterns to fit the expectations expectations of others right um so that's good too um and what, what mariana's saying here too is like so your memories and your personality are kind of like a series of events right um and this is where memories they can be false or or, or not verbal, right but like you have memories of things of, of the way that the family reunion um in Baton Rouge was when you were 12. And so like, and you, you, the, the food you had there, right? And that's a high point. So that helps configure your identity as like, as a, as somebody who likes Southern culture or Southern food or like the Louisiana or whatever it is, right? Um, and so the issue with the traumatic memory is it seems to like explode. Um, I, I mean that like not explode as in like zoom in, but like demolish um, one of these potential or perceptual islands in the chain of what is your diachronic, meaning your identity over time, like your identity at two points in time. Like, okay, I was, when I was, you know, whatever, when I was seven, um, I, I wanted to be a paleontologist and my favorite color was orange, right? When I, or well, I want to be a professional football player and a paleontologist and my favorite color is orange, right? When I got into high school, like I was like an anarchist and so my favorite colors are black and red, right? Like that changed over time, right? But that's me seeing these islands of memory, right? In my past and like linking them, right? Um, and, and so the issue with the traumatic memory is it refuses this kind of diachronic motion and to, to, to link, um, and di diachronic just being like two times at once, right? Like I'm here, me now, and can see me in the past and see how the events in my life to moving me from that point, right, on to now, yeah? Um, and, and so trauma upsets this because the memory or the, the island that you want to hop to or you need to hop to to make sense of yourself now, right, is elided or blown up or decimated or whatever by the traumatic memory. So all you have is like the effects of, uh, okay, the effects of the memory, right, um, playing out now, but you can't go back and trace it all the way through. And because of that, right, it is both, um, the unknowing of the crisis of the event, right, as well as its effects that are rippling out now that make it so paradoxical. Like, you can see the effects, right, but you can't see the source, sort of. So an analogy or an example I thought of, um, I hope the answer is 100% here. If not, it'll be a more lost analogy. Y'all seen the original Star Wars, like A New Hope, 1983, I think. 
Yeah. Anybody got? Okay, so Alderaan, no, Alderaan, right? Freaking like they're driving through the hyperspace. They're trying to get to Alderaan. Mm -hmm. right? Freaking Death Star blows up Alderaan, right? So it's literally like a decimate, right? And like Obi Wan Kenobi feels like he's like in the things like I felt a million lives cry out and scream of pain and suddenly be silent, right? So like. He's not there, right? And he doesn't know what the hell happened, right? This is this is not a perfect analogy, right? But like that Alderaan was destroyed, like the source of this trauma, right? His is no longer there, right? And there's no um when they emerge from hyperspace, right? Freaking there's just asteroid chunks flying around, right? Of course, you can logically deduce that well, that used to be fucking Alderaan, it's not there anymore, right? But like anyone else governed by didn't know how to do it, right? You still see the thing like that there was a pain that well welled out, right? And there's this wave or this ripple effect of it, right, that is remaining even though the planet itself is gone. And to try to connect the two is more difficult in, in distance, right? Like this island hobby of memory. I think another less nerdy example is if you take a, um, a stone and you skip it across a pool, right? Like after first cut. So the stone goes out and sinks, right? Um, and so if someone else walks along the pool then, right, they don't see the stone. All they see is like the series of ripply waves that come from the stone have being thrown at that point in time, right? And so like the trauma in some pictorially representative sense, right, is the stone that has sunken, right? And so all we have is this, this um, crisis of trying to answer why are these ripples here? Um, but we don't have access to the explanation. Or even if you say like, okay, well, Come on, stupid. Obviously, somebody threw a stone, right? Like, it seems like memories for us aren't going to try to, like, to, for memories to be valuable for us as humans, right? We don't want them to merely be like, oh, it must have been a stone, right? Oh, like, I must have been in a train wreck when I was four, right? It would be, it, it's, it's necessary for us to know, like, where that train wreck was. Like, how many people died? Was I injured? Was like, so just the fact that, oh, kid, you were in a train wreck, right? It's like, oh, there was a stone that was thrown. That kind of surface level analysis doesn't necessarily feel the kind of um, psychological closure or, 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 or um, contributive identity memory formation, right? Is necessary to have um, to do to not to avoid the traumatic um, process, right? We would want to know things like, okay, well, what kind of block was it? Was it feldspar? Was it gypsum? Was it quartz? Like, how big was it, right? Like, how fast was it thrown, right? Like these would be the kind of like it's an analogy, right? To the, the the way the train crash happened, as opposed to the composition of the rock, right? That somebody just saying, well, you can see the ripples, but the f doesn't matter, right? Like, okay, there was a train crash when you were four, you were in. Like, it, it's like if there are playing out that affect you in a nuanced psychological way when you're 25 or 21 or 35 or, or 18 or whatever, right? Like there is value in knowing the nuanced composition of the event itself. And this is exactly what trauma disallows or traumatic memory as she's talking about here disallows us. Doesn't allow us access to. I, I try to slay that cat or what he's in that cat like 90 different ways. Um, does that helping to configure what I'm talking? Is that more somewhat more clear than it was originally? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying y'all, y'all can write a book on this now. I'm just saying it's. Uh, I get what you're trying to say. Demurkified to some extent. Led like murky, not mercenary. The demurkied, demurked. Um. All right. So let's let's go ahead and turn now to the next um to the. I just wanted to get to that part because um. Actually, I lied. Sorry. Go to page freaking page nine. We're not going to get the introduction to this damn book. Um, page nine. Uh, yeah, sorry. The, the voice of the other. We need to read this part, too. Um, hope, I think since we just had a discussion we just had, we can get through. Um, we can get through this probably pretty easily. Uh, well, it, it, relatively speaking, right? Um so the theory, literary, this is on page eight in the book. Um, it's you know, page eight, not eight of eight in the scan, but I think it's page six in the scan, right? Um, the voice of the other. 
Uh, the theoretical and literary thrust of the present book can thus be illustrated in another way, as well as through Tasso's story, mm -hmm. and through Freud's example of the crying wound. While well, the story of Tancred, the repeated thrust of his unwanting of his unwitting sword and the suffering he recognizes to the voice he hears, represents the experience of an individual traumatized by his own past, mm -hmm. the repetition of his own trauma as it shapes his life. The wound that speaks is not precisely Tancred's own, but the wound, the trauma of another. It is possible, of course, to understand that the other voice, the voice of Clorinda within the parable of the example, to represent the other within the self that retains the memory of the unwitting traumatic events of one's past. We can also read the address as the voice here, not as the story of the individual in relation to the events of his own past, but as the story of which a story of the way in which one's own trauma is tied up with the trauma of another, the way in which trauma may lead, therefore, to an encounter with another through the very possibility and surprise of listening to another's wound. Right. So if you just look as an analogy or as an as an allegorical representation, right? The the voice. So yay. Sorry, I just saw the text. Um, so the voice of another, right, um, is, is, is in two things, right? So it's either the hearing the voice, trauma can be recognition of hearing somebody else's story and bearing witness of someone else's story, right? Like someone, um, I mean, just let's say, like okay, you're walking along Iraq, boom, IED goes up, right? You're okay, but your buddy gets blown blown up and died or loses a leg, whatever, right? Like you, you can see the wound of another and be traumatized. It doesn't have to be your leg, right? The same way, though, she's saying that there's the voice of the other within oneself, which is Freudian and Lacanian jargon-ish, right, for, like, the unconscious, the subconscious, which is why she says then, right, the voice of the other within the self, which is that part of the self, which is the unwitting recipient of the traumatic event. I, I mean, it doesn't mean exactly the subconscious or the unconscious, right? She just means, like, more or less the subconscious, right? The part at which the traumatic, I mean, if you want to look at neurobiologically speaking, right, and we'll get maybe into some of that here, but in other traumatic theory works, right, about the storing of the brain in the, the amygdala, the hippocampus, right, the, the more um, reptilian early formed um, parts of the brain, right, that are more um, trigger emotional, um, um, somatic related, like um, to, to the smell, and, and um, to tactility as opposed to um, touch and or smell and taste and tactility as opposed to t um, sight and, and um, sound, right? Yeah, so I think, Mariana, that's a good question. I think, I think possibly, right? Um, or so yes, as long as we think of that you, I think, right? As the if that you when you say they interpret the you before and the you after right if or the you before and the you now if that you is an amalgam of your conscious self your unconscious your subconscious self right so like then yes I don't think it's so much as in like um. So I think what you're saying is exactly right. I, I just don't want people to get the wrong idea that it's like, um, I don't know why I'm using, I don't even watch many movies, but um, what was that? Dawn of the, or Army of Darkness, the third version of Dawn of the Dead, right? Like Ash gets his arm cut off, right? And that's the traumatic event and he straps a chainsaw on his arm now, right? So it's not like the me I am now is just me with a chainsaw arm, right? There's a dialogue between like the interpret, the, the, between like, the event that it's, so it's not just like, Oh, look, it's, it's badass me now. Right. It's like, um, the dialogue or the difference between the, the, the voice is the voice is that dialogue between yourself before in your subconscious that made you <laughs> before the traumatic event and the dialogue between your self conscious and your conscious, um, that makes you, 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 you now. Does that make sense, Mariana? So I'm saying I'm saying you're right. Maybe my Army Dark example wasn't exactly perfect. Um, it may you're right as long as we think of the use in both of these circumstances as more than just like a physical you. That that you is a dialogue between the voice of your subconscious and your conscious self in both circumstances, right? And so the voice of the other is kind of like your your the change in the subconscious voice. How your subconscious voice maybe changes between the then and the now in relation to its dialogue with your consciousness. 
uh, than it is uh, as compared to now. I hope I didn't overly complicate that. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, no, I got you. I got you, man. So, yes, I think, I mean, to some, some, to some degree, it has to, right? But the question is, um, and this is the problem with trauma, right? How much of, or Chris is saying about trauma here, right? Is how much of that is, is, are we aware of the merging? Are we aware of the diverging? Are we aware of the influences in our subconscious life that, that we can then consider into being agents of our own actions in the now? And trauma is especially elusive in this regard, right? Because it seems to elide the memory process, right? Like you were saying before, the island hopping from memory before of ourselves to now, right? It's hard. I, I would just, I mean, put to you the question, like, it seems to me to be much harder to have a dialogue with one's past self or with the things, the effects that come from being a past self, right? Or, or a, a historical self as one of these islands of memory, right? And that island itself was either never fully discovered or was like, blown up like Alderaan, right? To, to have that merging happen, right, between the island you're on now and the island that's not there anymore or was never discovered, right, presents the problem. And so the, I think Ruth is saying that that merging still happens, right? But the level at which we're aware of it and the level at which, um, the level at, at which we can then use that or be aware of that as our amalgamation of ourselves, right, is this intersection of knowing and unknowing, right? That's happening regardless of if we know it or not, right? Like the intersectionality of these events is happening. Um, but the, the the effed up part is how how much agency um and and conscious thought do we have at the um at that point of intersection. Right. So yeah, I think you're saying that it does merge it has to. It, 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 it um, inevitably merges, right, or turns into, right. But 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 um, the question is, how much are we conscious of this process? And trauma seems to be a specific example of we don't fucking up, or or not as much as we would like to, right? Is that? I mean, I probably I don't know, I don't know if there are answers to any of these questions per se, right? But that um, I think your point is well taken. I think you hit you hit on where this this is a difficult issue, right? Because it is this this intersection of this turning or this merging, right? That that is happening below the level. I guess we would all like it to to be nice, well-adjusted people in the world, right? That is the um, the crux of the matter here. Um. All right. So then she goes. Um. So the next the next part of bottom of eight, right? Um, so I would suggest that such a listening to the voice and to the speech delivered by the other's wound is what takes place indeed in Freud's own text, whose theory of trauma is written not only about, but in the midst of trauma. The story of Tankard is thus equally, I would suggest, the story of psychoanalytic writing itself. The figure of Tankard addressed by the speaking wound constitutes, in other words, not only a parable of trauma and as a canny repetition, but more generally a parable of the psychoanalytic theory itself, as it listens to a voice that it cannot fully know, but which it is nonetheless bears to which it nonetheless bears witness, right? And she, I mean, that's one thing too, it's very interesting in her writing style here, right? Like, I think the second day of class, we uh, when we covered this, right, we read something that was almost exactly the same, um, it was the same damn words, right? But like, in a little bit of a different configuration earlier on. It's funny, and I think she's consciously aware that she's, as she's writing the book, the way that she is using repetition consciously, right? And she's talking about the parables of the psychoanalytic theory being a parable not only of the the theorist, the, the text which is theorized, Tanker, the theorist of the text, Freud, the situation when the text mm -hmm. is written, right? But the dialogue between all this, she's doing the same thing herself in the way she's writing this. Um. Or doing, she's trying to mimetically to mimic to make a mold of um, the same process she's discussing in the form of her own writing, which is I don't know if it's ever possible to succeed at that, but it's it's a damn not nah, um, noble um, pursuit, right? I mean, it, it's you know, it's been, don't try this at home, kids, kind of thing, right? All right. Um, so let's let's go now to the first page of the scan document, um, which is oh, 
Chapter one, finally. Um, unclean experience, trauma, and the possibility of history. Freud, Moses, monotheism, right? All right. Um, so, and this is a very, I, I like your opening paragraph here, even though it's not, um, that's what about trauma, because it kind of, I mean, maybe, maybe we can start just saying, um, it seems to be where Eagleton leaves us, um, or it has left us weeks ago, um, right? So, like, um, like, and that's why, I mean, maybe I can get just people's responses either via text or voice or whatever to, to this first paragraph here, which I think is what she means and what, what y'all think too. So recent literary criticism has shown an increasing concern that the epistemological problems raised by post-structuralist criticism necessarily lead to political and ethical paralysis. The possibility that reference is indirect and that consequently we may not have direct access to others or even our own histories seems to imply the possibility of access to other cultures and hence of any means of making political or ethical judgments. Um, so this is a, a, um, what do you call it? A, a not op a pessimistic, um, reading of what th theory and criticism have done, but I don't think it's an, I don't think it's a, a, an incorrect one. Um, I don't know. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think you're talking about? What do you think? Somebody was, somebody was saying something. Sorry. Can you remember that one? Oh, was that just somebody talking in the background section? I thought it was somebody giving a brilliant answer. I couldn't tell. Hey, six. Oh, I'm going to say something, six. Oh, sorry, please, please. Wait, what's up? Were you saying something that I heard? I've heard background noise. I was wondering if you're trying to say something. No, I was just, uh, I'm just here. All right, that's fine. That's fine. Um, well, um, Mariana, anybody? All right, so I'll just, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but like, say shit that I want. It's like the playing the What's in My Pocket game, right? In in The Hobbit, right? Like, what's in my pocket? Y'all gotta tell me. No, uh, so I, I think what she's saying here, right, is that there is a turn, um, like we talk about political criticism and how political theory, right? How thing everything's political, um, right? But like, if we take it the step further to, and we take some intersectionality theory in there, right? And there's lots of intersectional intersectional theory and, and a lot of critical race theory, right? Is it, the proper recognition, right? That like me as a white male don't have access to your experience as a woman, your accents as a, as a, as, as a Latinx person, your experience is a, is a trans. Latinx or trans non-binary per whatever the identity matrix you have, right, is not my experiences and so I have access to it, right? Um, and so the problem that she raises here, right, is that okay, if I can't have access to your experience, like that's just it's not only maybe epistemically, like philosophically, intellectually impossible for me to have that, but there's a ethical problem with me trying to have access to or claim ownership to or a, a colonizing effect of me saying I can understand your experience, right? Well, then if we're trying to act in a way that is ethical as human beings, right? And if our politics are supposed to be an amalgamation of, to some extent, of our ethics, right? Um, and I can't access your experience or even come to know it through reading stuff about that right because that's just shut off and in his colonization i'm going to do that then how can then is it possible at all for me to act in a way with the external world knowing that everyone else has different experiences as mine right which can be seen as politically or ethically justifiable it seems i mean you can square the circle a little bit right but it seems that largely the answer on a logical basis right has to be no if it's actually impossible for me to know your experience, to the, right, or it's actually maybe even ethically wrong of me to attempt to know your experience if you, because you're a different intersectional whole than I am, right? And because of power structures and whatnot, it's not helpful. For me. It, it's, it's not only not helpful, it's unethical and bigoted and wrong of me to attempt to come to terms with that, right? Well, then anything I'm bound to do is bound to be insensitive, oppressive, bigoted, um, 
unethical, right? And if my concern is being as a human being is to be an ethical human being, and my concern as a as a member of a political system is to incorporate ethics into the polity, right? Well, I'm kind of screwed, aren't I? Okay. Like, I mean, I can act in a certain way, right? Um, I can act. I mean, I can I can act in whatever the f way I want to, right? Um, but that's granted. It's gonna. It's not even attempting to be ethical. Then, right? It's just Machiavellian, right? And so she's saying that the the really critical theory tools we've had in post structuralist, right? The level of devolution of experience of of uh, the the veracity and the truth of experience, right, into being completely inaccessible, right? Seems to lead to or or constitute a political and ethical paralysis, right? By that, what they means is that I can't do anything ethical. Then I can't form a politics, which is part of the ethics, right? I'm just kind of screwed, right? And so, and so that's just. I think it's um. I think if the political, if, if I think if theory, maybe this goes for any theory, right? If any theory is taken too far, right, it leads to a sort of paralysis because it is, like we said before, a totalizing explanation of everything, right? And if you have a totalizing explanation of everything, there's no reason to explore further ethical paradigms or political structures or whatever. So maybe this is a totality for all theory, but I think it's especially germane in her talk about literary theory as it stands. Um, but I just thought it was relevant to stuff we talked about in class. So I just wanted to bring that up and kind of run through the logic and the argument about that claim um, before we continue, which we'll continue. So, okay. Um, to such an argument, I would like to contrast a phenomena that not only arises in the reading of literary or philosophical texts, but emerges most prominently within the wider historical and political realms. That is peculiar and paradoxical experience of trauma. In its most general definition, trauma describes an overwhelming experience of sudden or catastrophic events in which the response to the event occurs in the often delayed, uncontrolled, repetitive appearance of hallucinations and other intrusive phenomena. Right? This is a, if we look at the footnote, uh, this is a, a combination of, um, I think, Van der Kloek's definition of trauma, who's a neurobiologist, and the DSM's definition of PTSD and traumatic experience, um, right? Um, so basically she's saying that there's something about traumatic experience, right, that seems to defy these notions of non-communicability of experience through intersectionality and post-structuralism, right? Um, that even so, even so, basically say so. Okay, um, if we have a model, a structure of thinking, right, in, in intersectionality, and post-structuralism, critical race theory, right, that, like my experiences are inaccessible to you because we don't have the same intersectional background, right, and yours are inaccessible to me because of the same reason, right, um, and because of that, um, like there's no, like the experience is inaccessible, right, and, and there's no relatability in that, and the attempt to do so is either potentially colonizing and bigoted and harmful, potentially um, what, like like selling out or, or um, being a traitor to one's own identity to try to get someone else to, ex to ex understand the experience, right? Because that's an impossibility anyways, right? And so um, the idea here is that the, there is, so that's, a, that's not an intersection of knowing and unknowing, right? That's a dead end of unknowing, right? And that somehow in trauma, that unknowing, even across any identity group, right, can be overlaid with the possibility of productive knowledge in the weird structure of traumatic experience and memory and the voice crying out in the wound and the witnessing of the voice and in the rep repetition of this, right? And we look at like generational trauma as another example of this kind of all of a sudden there's this unknowing experience, with, of experience that somehow is though painfully, productively intersected with a structure of knowing. Um, not knowing something necessarily, but knowing as a possibility in, in, writ large, right? Um, so the experience of the soldier it was sudden, faced with sudden and massive death around him, for example, who suffers the sight in a number 
in a numb state only to relive it later on in repeated nightmares is a central and recurring image of trauma in our century. As a consequence of the increasing occurrence of such perplexing war experiences and other catastrophic responses in the last 20 years, physicians and psychiatrists have begun to reshape their thinking about physical and mental experience, including most recently the responses to a wide variety of other experiences such as rape, child abuse, auto and industrial accidents, and so on, that are now often understood in terms of its effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. I propose that, the, that it is here equally widespread and bewildering encounter in trauma, both in its occurrence and the attempt to understand it, we begin to recognize the possibility of a history that is no longer straightforwardly referential, that is no longer based on simple models of experience and reference. So all that really kind of boils down to that last damn sentence, right? Like models of experience and reference, right, are what? This is my experience in my life, right? And it's monolithic. It's mine because I'm a subject for me. My subjectivity is based upon my real my inner is based upon the relation of my intersectional identity, right? My life experiences and my ability to articulate those and um, present myself in the public square based upon that. Right? However, that experience is inaccessible to anyone who doesn't share or even people who do share to some degree my intersectional identity because my experience is still mine, right? It's my right? And, and so she's arguing that, like, we our notions of critical theory and even intersectional theory, right, are not, I'm not, she's not saying they're wrong and horrible. She's saying, like, that's based on a very linear, straightforward model of experience and reference, right? And that the structure of trauma does not seem to be linear and straightforward. It seems to be somehow paradoxical and, like, I mean, Look like a 2D line graph, right? If you add the third dimension in there, the ways that things can relate to each other in a three-dimensional space as opposed to a two-dimensional space, right, are literally geographically more numerous, right? Um, so maybe I think she's saying we're, we're trying to use a flat map of the world to talk about a space that's actually a freaking sphere, right? And that maybe even our notion of intersectionality, though they work in a two-dimensional world, right? And I'm not saying they're wrong large right like maybe their reality would actually inhabit it would provide other possibilities for relationality and experience that lie without or without or lie outside of the basic structure of experience and memory is linear and reference as only possible through segues of similar identity or through channels of similar identity um so through the notion of trauma, I will also understand that a rethinking of reference is not aimed at eliminating history, not aimed at eliminating your experiences, not aimed at eliminating your intersectional identity, your personal history, or history itself at large, right? But at resituating it in our understanding, that is at precisely permitting history to arise where immediate understanding may not. This is a, cre a, cre a critical, a key, a key phase, right? A phrase that so well, what does it mean right um when our immediate understanding of someone else of someone else's intersectionality right does not arise right but history meaning all the things that have made us up to this point in time the person we are right um which are not linear right um like what does it mean if we let history in the sense of like not of relationality it's not linear right uh, arise in moments where we don't have an immediate understanding of each other, right? If we look to all those little things, traumatic and not traumatic, known and not known, subconscious, unconscious, right? That constitute a person's whole being, right? From not a space that, okay, we can, I can know this as a subject. It's not that I can study and know, like I can study and know you as, as, a, as a trans Hispanic um, person of color, right? Um, like, Okay, like I can know those things, right? But those things, right, don't constitute the totality of the history of you. Those are ascribed linear, right? In its intersectionally linear point, right? So even intersectional theory, intersectionality is what? It's the intersection of two points of identity, right? And you have then a linear graph that plots the points of the two intersections or the multiple section intersections of identity that constitute one's um, identity at that point in time, right? But this is saying, like, well, what if there are more dimensions to this, right? What if we're immediate understanding of these points of intersection can't align because my line goes this way and your line goes that way, right? And so, like, the intersectionality of you and me don't match. What if there's another dimension to this scope, right? What if there's another way that, like, 
can be rooted not in me trying to know shit or me saying I know shit, but it's rooted in me understanding that I don't know shit and that you don't know shit. And then based upon this not understanding, this intersection of knowing and not knowing, right? There's a place for growth and listening to the wounds, the trauma, the experience of another person whose experiences aren't aligned with your own, right? And that's a productive listening that can tell you not only about them, right? Not only about their history, not them as a, a stable, stable entity, right? But them as this amalgam of historical events, but can also speak to yourself, right? And so the voice of the other can be the voice within yourself if you bloody well listen to it, right? That can help change the way that you view your own history, right? As well as the way that you view the complex history that goes into the identity of the person you're addressing at the time, the wound, the trauma, the history of the person is speaking to you in whatever form that takes. Um, I think to some degree, that's what she's getting at um, right here on the bottom of page 11. Um, so we'll, we'll stop there. We're out of time for today. Um, so we'll pick up on Thursday at page 11, okay? Um, somebody's trying to... FaceTime me? I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I'm just with y'all. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, freaking uh, page 11 on Thursday, we'll pick up with. Um, no, Maddie, Maddie, we're done with the, we're done with the chapter over. The last one was the one that you turned in was day three. So, you're you're good. Who the F is trying to call me on what method of communication? Oh, Sixto, is that you? Or is that you bringing through? Uh, no, I don't think so. All right. I'm like, I can't. You hear? Y'all hear that? Boom, boom. Boom. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like Skype. Yeah, it's Teams, but it's not. Oh, never mind. It was a it was a freshman comp student trying to team with me on a different window. I'm sorry. I'm like, what are these bells in my head? No. All right, we're good. Sorry about that, y'all. Um, so yeah, so we're so the last chapter overview we were doing was the third one on the group. So y'all are if y'all have gotten through that point, you're done with them. If you're not gotten that point, um Get to that point and then stop. All right. Gotcha. All right. Um, so yeah. So thank you all very much. I will like a Thursday. We'll be back with class. I'll probably ask more questions about how we're doing with papers. Just like give you positive nudges to make sure we're doing okay. Um, and then in redrafts, you can be coming back in the meantime and pick up. So same scan document. I'll probably upload it again just for the benefit of whoever um, might lose it or whatever. So bottom of page 11, the question of the history of Trump or the question of history is raised most urgently. So if you can read just the rest of that PDF for next time or or all of chapter one, if you haven't done that already, um, or if you have done it, reread it because it's, as I hope we found out, it's not just in my head. This is a, a dense text that takes, I think, multiple readings to get the stuff out of, yeah? All right. So, hey, y'all have a great – I hope y'all think yeah. it's great. Y'all have a great rest of the week, um, and we'll see you Thursday. All right, sweet. Hey, take care. I'll post a recording of this up if people want to rewatch it for my hilarious comment. Yeah.